Hello and welcome. I'm Katherine Banwell, your host for today's webinar. This program is part of our Thrive series, and today we're going to discuss navigating life with an MPN. Before we get into the discussion, please remember that this program is not a substitute for seeking medical advice. Please refer to your healthcare team about what might be best for you. Well, let's meet our guest today. Joining me is Dr. Joseph Skandura. Welcome, Dr. Skandura. Would you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Joe Skandura. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell in New York City. Uh, I am uh, a physician scientist. I actually run a lab studying MPNs and, and uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and I am scientific director of the uh, Silver MPN Center at Cornell. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to, to join us today. We start all of the webinars in our Thrive series with the same question. In your experience, what do you think it means to thrive with an MPN? I mean, as a goal, I think it's very simple, symptom-free and normal life expectancy. You know, thriving with an MPN is living your life as though you didn't have an MPN. And one part of thriving with an MPN is finding a treatment approach that manages your disease, the symptoms of your MPN, and that fits with your lifestyle. So what, what are the factors that are considered when choosing treatment for patients with ET, PV, and MF? Certainly the goals of the therapy. So is the therapy one that I would be looking to, to maybe delay progression or for long-term potential benefits, or is it something I need now to control short-term risks such as blood clots? Um, the goals of the patient, uh, because you know some therapies may be more suitable to the goals of a pa one patient than another. And the other, you know, there's clinical features that kind of may push towards uh, one approach versus another. Uh, certainly, you know, in a 20-year-old patient, I'm thinking about fertility. I'm thinking about, you know, normal life expectancy. In a 90-year-old patient, you know, I have a different set of concerns, uh, multiple medications. What, uh, you know, am I going to do that might, you know, be uh, affecting their other comorbid conditions? I think about what are my near-term and long-term goals. So obviously age uh, becomes a factor there. If I'm uh, 95 years old, no matter what I do, that person is not going to live 20 years. If that person's 20 years old and they're not living, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, that's a real shame. That's a huge loss of life. Um, so, you know, that, that helps uh, kind of point me in one direction or another. And then there's different types of therapy. There are injectable agents, there are pills, there are drugs that have been used for a long time, but don't really have an FDA approval. There are drugs that are approved for certain indications, you know, and, you know, as physicians, we can sometimes stretch that a little bit based upon clinical judgment. So I think a lot of that goes into the discussion I have with patients about therapy. Um, and that's always you know, I present to them what the options are, what I think the uh, benefits might be, what the potential toxicities are, and then we discuss. Right. I would imagine monitoring patients is different for each of the MPNs. So uh, how are patients typically monitored over time? And uh, let's start with essential thrombocythemia. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, again, it's similar, you know, what's near term, what's long term. And so in all of these diseases, thrombosis risk is, is a near-term risk. That's something that uh, um, I am monitoring in certain ways to help mitigate that risk. Uh, in ET and PV, I approach them similarly. Blood counts are certainly, you know, these are diseases of the blood forming system. Um, certainly monitoring blood counts I find helpful, but the reality of it, it is in ET, there is not a clear linkage between blood counts and risks. And so I like to keep the platelet count near normal if I can, but I also recognize that it may not be worth suppressing all of the blood counts to achieve that landmark because it's not clear that that's really uh, reducing the risk any more than just having somebody on uh, a medication that helps control the blood counts. Um, in Polycythemia vera, you know, different blood counts are very important. The red blood cells are kind of like part of the, the uh, uh, clotting risk. Uh, we know from clinical trials that keeping 
the red blood cell parameters within certain uh, ranges reduces the risk of clotting. Um, and uh, so what I monitor in polycythemia vera is the hematocrit. Uh, in women, I like to keep it below 42. In men, I like to keep it below 45. But I don't just, you know, I'm not a slave to the hematocrit. I am keeping an eye on the other uh, blood counts and the other red blood cell parameters. So for instance, what's the size of the red blood cells? You know, that tells me a little bit about what's going on in the blood formation for that patient and what's the number of red blood cells. So sometimes people can have very small red cells because they're a little iron deficient and have a huge surplus of the number of red blood cells. And that tells me a little bit about how their blood forming system is responding to uh, therapy. Uh, iron deficiency in polycythemia vera is very prominent. I personally believe it's a, it's a major driver of symptoms who are uh, in patients who are receiving phlebotomy as part of their care. Um, and it's something that uh, I monitor and, and really counsel patients on. My goal is to make people phlebotomy independent, um, and but it can take a while. Everybody starts out iron deficient, and then we take iron out of their body uh, through uh, blood, you know, uh, with blood, with the phlebotomy, and that makes them more iron deficient. Um, I monitor symptoms from patients. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that can tell me uh, that their disease needs to be, their treatment needs to be tweaked a little bit, even something as simple as aspirin. You know, people can sometimes have burning in the skin or itching uh, that is sometimes responsive to changing the aspirin, aspirin dose or how it's given once a day versus twice a day. And, you know, that simple thing can be a big change for a patient who's kind of, you know, literally climbing out of their skin or wishing they could um, and to try and find something that is uh, uh, helping. And I, I know I'm kind of going a little bit long, but I would say one other thing is I see patients for a very long time. Right. So I can follow patients for I'm getting old enough now that I've followed patients for decades. And when things are going well, I don't see my job as being over. I see them more than any other physicians. Like I had a patient the other day at COVID. I said, oh, you should probably get this medication. Uh, do you have your primary care physician? You know, who, who's taking care of you? And he goes, well, to be honest with you, you're my guy. And so, you know, it's like it's true. I see this patient a lot. And so, you know, sometimes they forget if I'm not paying attention to their blood pressure, you know, the risks or, or treatment of diabetes, cholesterol, lipids, you know, their screening programs for mammogram or colonoscopy, you know, health maintenance issues. I, I do keep an eye on that in, in uh, patients because I do think it's a part of the MPNs. I think that there are excess risks for patients uh, for cert some of these factors. Certainly, uh, you know, if you think of it as three strikes, you know, they get a strike for having an MPN. I don't want them to have any other strikes. So diabetes, hypertension, those are strikes that I can potentially at least uh, treat um, or refer them to somebody to help with co-manage with me. Um, and so that's that's kind of my general approach. What about patients who have myelofibrosis? Are they monitored more closely? You know, I think it depends a little bit on the patient. Patients with early myelofibrosis often don't have any symptoms or near-term risks much different than those from ET or PV. Uh, as the disease can progress, then some of these patients have, you know, more profound problems with uh, symptoms. Uh, which I may be trying to find uh, a solution to make them feel better. And also blood counts can become more of an issue. Uh, transfusions in, in some patients or a very high white blood cell count. Uh, you know, the spleen is often quite enlarged, although in my experience, most patients aren't really bothered by the size of their spleen as much as the, as the physicians are. Uh, but uh, it is something where I think on average, they're monitored a little, uh, a bit more closely to quite a bit more closely, depending on the patient. Yeah. You mentioned blood counts and, and we know that lab results can fluctuate a bit. What happens if someone suddenly has a change in blood counts? What do you do? Yeah. I mean, repeat it. That's the, the first thing. Uh, also check what's going on. It's not uncommon in patients with MPNs that you know, I'll see them and the counts are, you know, a little bit out of whack. The white count is much higher than it's been. 
and, you know, and questioning them like, oh yeah, I had X, Y, or Z last week or the week before they had a, you know, it used to be a, a URA upper respiratory tract infection, or they had, um, you know, a, a minor surgical procedure. And sometimes the responses to these things can be accentuated in patients with MPNs. And so, you know, if that's what's uh, part of this story, you know, I certainly would repeat it and let things calm down a little bit. And that's often all it is. Um, I, I'm a much more of a, um, uh, a monitor of the trends. So, you know, one-time measure doesn't generally excite me. It may make me want to have a follow-up a little bit more uh, uh, in a shorter period of time. Um, of course, it depends on what the change is, but for most of the changes that we observe, they're, you know, relatively minor um, and I will monitor them over time. If I see a trend where something is progressively increasing or decreasing over time, then I start thinking about what else is going on. And that's always in the context of what's going on with the patient. How are they feeling? What's their physical exam like? What are the other laboratory values like? When is a bone marrow biopsy necessary? Uh, I would say a bone marrow biopsy is absolutely necessary at the time of diagnosis. I personally do not routinely monitor by bone marrow biopsy unless it's part of a clinical trial. Um, but I do uh, uh, perform a bone marrow or, or want to look at the bone marrow morphology if there is one of these changes or, or at least a, you know, a trend that I want a little bit more information about. Um, and so if, uh, or, you know, if it's been a very long time since somebody has had a bone marrow, you know, if it's been five or 10 years, and sometimes I may recommend we look just so we can collect a little bit more up-to-date information. But I don't routinely do a bone marrow, but I will do it if there are laboratories that are kind of trending in the wrong direction. There's symptoms or physical findings that I'm just not sure about. And I think it would help me uh, be more sure as to what's going on and, in, and be able to discuss that with the patient. Sometimes just to say, hey, look, you know, we were worried about this, but the bone marrow looks really good. Yeah. Can you talk about shared decision making and why is it so important for patients to work closely with their healthcare team on choosing a therapy? Uh, because these are therapies that last for a long time. And hopefully, you know, the patients and the relationship lasts for a long time. And so, you know, I think that everybody has to be comfortable with the decision about a therapy. And I, I, my personal goal is always to try to make sure that everybody understands the rationale for a therapy, the, the potential ups and downs with a the therapy, which every drug has, every approach has. Um, and what, what I'm kind of watching and monitoring, I, I'm a very, uh, I think that communication relieves a lot of anxiety. Um, I think that the unknown is far scarier than the known, even if it's not perfect. And so I think shared decision-making has a role uh, in relieving some of the, the uh, scariness of, of unknown. It's like if we're discussing to come to a decision, that means that my job is to give you the knowledge that I have so you can tell me the knowledge about you and what you're feeling and what you want back. And that back and forth is what helps me do a better job taking care of the patient and helps the patient understand what's going on and relieve some of the stress of the unknown. So I think it's a very synergistic approach. I, I, I don't think I could practice medicine in another way. Dr. Skandura, much of our MPN community is highly engaged in their care. What are some educational resources you would recommend for people who are seeking more information about their condition? Um, I, I think that there's some basic information available from a, a variety of, uh, for instance, the National Cancer Institute has some basic information. Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has some basic information. The MPN Research Foundation has some basic information. And then um, uh, there are some information websites that are run by uh, corporations, which are, I think they try to be even even handed uh, in, in some of the discussion and has some you know, good information there too. I think the 
none of these is a perfect source of information. I don't think there is one source that you can go to for every to answer every question uh, that you could ask. Well, my uh, MPN Center has a web, website with a bunch of QAs, and we just every now and then add a new one, and it's just a really long list. Um, so, you know, uh, these are questions our patients frequently ask us, and we, you know, sort of put answers there uh, to help guide, but individual details are often more important than sort of generalizations. I find patient, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, what about the the forms, patient forms that are available? Are, are, is that something you would recommend? What kind of I find my patients do is they'll go out and look for information because, you know, patients with MPNs, thankfully, uh, tend to live a long time. And they uh, are often curious about their disease and want to do better and, and figure out how they can do better. And so a lot of them will go to whatever, whatever sources are available. But I generally, they come back. So we circle back, we regroup. And sometimes, you know, it's la la land, you know, a little bit crazy things. And sometimes it's really interesting. I learn a lot, you know, what's going on in terms of what are patients really reporting because sometimes in a clinic visit, people kind of don't say everything or, or they forget to say something. And, or maybe just my experience, I don't see every patient in the world, right? So, you know, if it's something that's relatively rare, uh, then, you know, I, I may not have seen it um, with a new drug or something like that. So I can learn uh, from that experience as well. So I think it's kind of like, uh, people go out there, they can be like little honeybees and collect all the information uh, from all the flowers out there. And then they come back and we regroup in the nest. And you know, we discuss, you know, and decide what, what makes sense what, to them, what's relevant to them, and what might help with our decision making. Yeah. Managing the worry associated with a diagnosis or concerns even about progression can lead to a lot of anxiety and fear amongst patients. Why is it important for them to share what they're feeling with their healthcare team? I, I mean, I would say this, for if our goals are to have people, I mean, this is what I say to patients, like, I want you to think about this disease when you're here. And then when you're not here, my goal is to have you not thinking about this disease because you're feeling okay and you're, you're comfortable and confident in what's going on. So I want to make it a clinic visit disease. That's not always possible. But for many patients, it is. I don't want somebody to become, to start thinking like a sick person when they're not. I don't want the diagnosis to be the disease, right? I want the person to, if they're feeling well, to recognize that, live your life, you know, move on with, with things. But at the same time, the, the, you know, these kinds of diagnoses are scary. And so it is normal with a new diagnosis or a change in the diagnosis to go through a period of time where you have to adjust. And so that's normal and you have to work your way through it. Some people and for, uh, you know, want to work that all out internally. And that's good to a certain extent, as long as they have good supports at home. But I also often want to know how they're doing, how they're, they're working through that so I can get a gauge of how it's affecting their life and the duration where this adjustment is going on. So somebody who's still ad adjusting to a new diagnosis two years after the diagnosis and they're otherwise clinically well, that's getting into the range where it's, it's not normal. You might need additional help. You might need counseling. You know, and, and in some patients, you know, that might include some medications for a short period of time. You know, the goal is, is to have the disease affecting you only insofar as it's affecting you, not the idea of the disease. And so, you know, that's, a, a again, it's a conversation. There are lots of resources. You know, people being individuals deal with things in their own way. And I, I just try to uh, help understand with them how it's how it's affecting their life and if it seems to be more than i would expect i'll tell them that and then we can discuss that you know it doesn't mean we have to do something today but uh, I, I will tell them i think this is 
you know, maybe a little bit more, like, why are you so worried? And, you know, I think you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can a social worker or somebody else on the healthcare team help with these emotional needs that patients have? Absolutely. We have great social worker. Uh, I tap into them all the time. Um, we also, uh, you know, have a uh, group uh, of psychiatrists who are really interested in, um, you know, the, the, kind of psychiatry that's related to uh, oncology and the diagnoses and how it impacts uh, care. Uh, I mean, this is New York City, so everybody has a therapist. <laughs> but a lot of patients have to have pre-existing um, uh, connections to healthcare providers or support systems. Um, I think for some patients, uh, you kind of groups are helpful. We'd be remiss if we didn't bring up financial concerns. Treatment and regular appointments can really become quite expensive. Understanding that everyone's situation is different, of course, where can patients turn if they need resources for financial support? Yeah, it, it depends on what the issue is. So one of the biggest areas that I've found uh, this can interfere with care is when we have co-pays that are really uh, not, not, not reasonable, not affordable. And so how do we uh, how do we fix that? How do we get access to you know an agent that might be beneficial for a patient, but that uh, you know and the insurance has approved it, but they've approved it with such a high copay that it's an it's just not a, an option anymore. And so there are foundations, the Pan Foundation, we often will uh, reach out to for copay assistance. And actually many companies, have copay assistance programs for their individual drugs. Um, and so we have some of our nurses who are quite good at navigating these uh, um, different agencies. And some of them are kind of drug specific. And because we see you know, a lot of patients with MPNs uh, and the number of drugs is not that great, um, we, you know, we were pretty tapped into what are the options uh, for a copay assistance that might be helpful. And it often works. It doesn't always work. Um, you know, we often, uh, I've actually, I had a patient I saw pretty routinely. Um, and I kind of like, like my certain group of labs that kind of make me feel like I, I have a good sense of what's going on, but you know, he was getting killed with the, the lab costs. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he mentioned this to me and, and then I have to do what I tell my, I have three teenage daughters, right? I, and, you know, when they were littler, smaller, younger, um, you know, I, 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 we spent a lot of time distinguishing needs from wants, right? So this was one of those instances, like what laboratory do I need to make sure that this patient is safe? What do I want? Because it makes me feel like I'm, I'm you know, have a better idea of what's going on. And maybe I can back off on those wants uh, if I'm seeing the patient pretty frequently, which I happen to be at that time. And so, you know, that some of that is a conversation. It, it depends on the specifics of the insurance and um, uh, and and a little bit of a, a, a back and forth and knowing how to, to kind of minimize that financial burden uh, when that's starting to compromise care. Yeah. Let's answer a few audience questions that we received in advance of the webinar. This one is from Sophie. What complications can arise from an MPN during pregnancy? Well, look, I mean, pregnancy, here, here you have two things, one of them common and complicated and the other one uncommon and complicated. So common is pregnancy, but every pregnancy is different. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of changes going on, uh, in the body. Um, and there's certain risks that can go along with that as well. So clotting risks sometimes can be increased in pregnancy. Um, and then you have an MPN where you have a, a clotting risk on top of that. The pregnancy really changes what kinds of medications we can think about using. And so, you know, there are certain medications that we use uh, uh, comfortably uh, in patients that would be an absolutely forbidden medication in uh, a pregnant woman. And so uh, it depends a little bit on, on uh, what's going on with the patient. But if they have a history of 
of clotting, then certainly we would think about wanting to control the blood counts. Depends a little bit on what the disease is, how we would do that. Interferons are commonly used uh, in pregnancy and they are safe in pregnancy and can improve the outcomes uh, in some patients with pregnancy. Um, uh, but short of that, uh, in patients, for instance, who are at very high thrombotic risk, sometimes we have to sort of balance the risk of having a clot and, and something that can interfere with the pregnancy and the risk of bleeding. So it's not uncommon that people are on blood thinners uh, during pregnancy at some point. Um, uh, but it really depends on the individual patient. What we do here is we keep very close uh, uh, contact with the patients. And, you know, all of our patients are seen by the high risk uh, OBGYN. So it's not the general obstetrics people who are monitoring uh, their patients. So they're, they're much more closely monitored um, and uh, for complications of pregnancy. And we are seeing them more frequently during pregnancy uh, to help from the MPN side to try to optimize and minimize the risks of clot. And that doesn't end as soon as the baby's out. Um, you know, there's uh, in if, uh, breastfeeding, the, the clotting risk is not normalized after pregnancy as soon as the baby comes out. And so, you know, there's a adjustment for several months afterwards where we're still kind of thinking about uh, this person you know, a little bit differently than we would if they were not or had not been recently pregnant. Yeah. We have another question, uh, this one from Jennifer. She wonders, is there research being done on MPN progression to understand how it happens or even prevent or slow progression? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot. I think there is uh, um, a, uh, from both the sort of basic laboratory uh, using animal models to try to understand what are the kind of uh, systems that are involved in how these diseases change, you know, what genes are involved, how do they talk to each other, how they, you know, these are not cells that live in a vacuum, right? They live in a, a special microenvironment. What are the signals that crosstalk between the MPN cells, the MPN stem cells and their microenvironment? Um, and so there's a lot of research on that and the basic side of, of things in humans, there's a lot that has been done over the years in terms of trying to understand what are some of the genetic features of progression. And I think we're beginning to get a little bit of a better understand of what are the non-genetic things that are associated with progression. I was part of a uh, effort from the MPN Research Foundation um, and still am. They have what they call the progression network, where they tried to put together a number of investigators from really across the world um, to share ideas about, you know, the nature of progression and how we might uh, look at studying this and understanding uh, ways to prevent progression. I think we do have some drugs now that show some pro pro promise in terms of uh, being able to prevent uh, progression. I think interferons uh, have shown this in polycythemia vera. Uh, in terms of uh, a promise for improved long-term outcomes and delayed risk of progression. Uh, I think that the gold standard randomized trials um, are maturing and are, are sort of bearing out some of the same uh, findings that, that uh, have been observed retrospectively, so sort of kind of looking back in time. But the difficulty is um, that it can take a long time for patients to progress. So you say, oh, that's great. And that is great. But from a research, from a statistical side, it means things are really slow. You know, if you have to wait 15 years to assess whether or not people progress less in one, one treatment versus another, it's really slow going. And so we have to, you know, do a compromise of uh, what's, you know, what do animal studies say? What does retrospective analysis where we might have people who started treatment 30 years ago, and now we're just seeing how did it all work out? Uh, it's not a perfect study because biases can creep in, but it's what we have now. Uh, and so there's a lot. And I think increasingly progression is being recognized as a goal of therapy to prevent progression. Personally, it is one of my major goals because I think we do a pretty good job at preventing clots. 
with available treatments. But I don't think we do a very good job at preventing progression, mostly because we don't exactly understand what's driving that. Um, and so I think until we uh, develop that deeper understanding and, and really invest the time and effort in terms of learning uh, which approaches can help prevent progression, um, you know, it, it's going to be, uh, we're going to continue to have these questions. Yeah. Well, thank you for those answers, Dr. Skandura. And please continue to send in your questions to question at powerfulpatients.org and we'll work to get them answered on future programs. As we close out this conversation, Dr. Skandura, I would like to get your thoughts on where we stand with progress with MPN care. Are there advances in treatment research that you're hopeful about? Yeah, I, I think it's a very exciting time, actually. I, I think that over the past five to 10 years, the amount of, uh, of new drugs that have been developed and tested in patients uh, has you know, grown uh, exponentially. Um, the number of companies that are targeting uh, MPNs for their drug development uh, is, uh, has expanded dramatically. Um, the number of clinical trials, good quality clinical trials has increased dramatically. And, you know, I think the success uh, that's coming out of that is we start seeing drugs now that are looking to be very, very effective. I don't want to name, you know, individual drugs, but I know we have a number of clinical trials where we're seeing things with these agents that we haven't seen with our traditional therapies, meaning you know, changes in the bone marrow that we haven't seen before, or uh, a normalization of uh, uh, symptoms or, or blood counts where that's in, a, in an area that has been challenging in the past. And so we now have, you know, drugs and, and uh, a number of drugs going for approval, a number of newly approved drugs, um, even interferon, which is a drug that's been around forever, uh, well, not forever, but I mean, I guess forever, yeah, because it's a it's a natural product. So as long as there've been humans, there have been uh, interferons even before humans. But now we have, as a pharmaceutical, they've been around for decades, and we now have the first. Even though we've been using it for decades, we have the first approved FDA approved interferon for polycythemia vera, which is, I think, a a, a huge change that a company invested the money in getting FDA approval for an agent. Um, and that means they have to, the bar is higher and they have to prove something that just using it off label hasn't. So I, I think it's a tremendously exciting time. I expect it's going to continue. Uh, we're going to continue to have improvements in care. Uh, there's going to be, you know, combinations of drugs. I think, I think that we're going to see real advances over the next five to 10 years. Well, Dr. Skandur, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. That was a pleasure. It was nice meeting with you. And thank you to all of our partners. To learn more about MPNs and to access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit PowerfulPatients.org. I'm Catherine Banwell. Thanks for being with us today. Mm -hmm.